Welcome to Massey College. Mon nom est Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here. I want to acknowledge that Massey College is built on Indigenous land, the land of the Yorondwandat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. Massey College has been thinking about COP26 for over a year, uh, thinking about what should be happening right now. And I think I'm very grateful to the co-chair of COP, Massey is Missing COP26, uh, Diane Sachs and Rosemary McCartney for having been at the forefront of this issue. And today I think I'm looking forward to this discussion, important discussion on sustainable finance. So without further ado, uh, welcome and thank you again to Diane Sachs. Well, thank you very much, Prince, Principal de Rosier, for joining us today. Hello, everybody. So yes, as those of you who've been following know, we at Massey College launched Massey is Missing COP26 a year ago when we were missing COP26 because this is the Conference of the Parties, uh, the 26th one uh, since the signing of the Global Treaty on Climate Change. And it was supposed to happen in November 2020. And it didn't happen, and so we were missing it. So we started a series of events here at Massey College, generously hosted by Principal DeRosie and the staff. And if you've missed our events, we've had a great series of conversations. They're all available on the Massey website. If you uh, look under our work, you'll see the climate page. You can also find them on the YouTube channel. Uh, our most recent conversation, if you missed it, you should definitely go back and hear. This was about indigenous voices in climate action, a really important part of the conversation. Um, but today, here we are, it is November of 2021, and COP26 is actually on right now in Scotland. And tomorrow is Finance Day at COP26. So we're getting a day's jump on the international conversation. Um, we have the privilege of having three guests with me today. Alex Chapman, who's sitting here in person. It seems very odd to be just talking to somebody in person, but uh, Alex trekked in on the GO train from Guelph to join us today, uh, head of Our Energy Guelph, and we're really glad to have him. Um, a little farther afield, we have Tom Rand, uh, who is somewhere online. There you are, Tom. Tom is uh, at the moment in Montreal and joining us from there. Tom is a noted venture capitalist and a leading invest inventor in clean technologies that will lead, and particularly breakthrough technologies that we need for the future. And we have someone actually at COP. So we have, uh, Robin, are you there? Robin Edger, who is in, just flew all night, I think, and just yes. got to Edinburgh and is totally jet lagged and is staying up to talk to us anyway. So Robin, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So the, the purpose of our conversation today, we did have a sustainable finance conversation last year at the opening of this series. Um, it was very high level talking about the Export Development Bank and, and so on, and we didn't get into a lot of specifics. I wanted today to get more specific because we know, uh, I've been hearing this story for many years, and certainly the whole time I was the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, I heard this story over and over and over again. We have a really well-educated, innovative, diverse population with lots of great ideas about the things that we could be doing on climate. Um, as some of you know, I have a podcast, Green Economy Heroes. I've been interviewing people running green businesses all across Canada, and there's all kinds of them. But what I hear from every single one of them is, it's really, really hard to get financing. It's really hard, especially for people who actually want to build things and not just develop apps, to get money and stay in Canada at the same time. We have this notorious valley of death that our innovators go through. They come up with great ideas. A lot of great ideas get spun out of our universities. The best and the brightest, like some of the young people here at Massey, and then they go out in the real world and they can't get money unless they sell out to Americans or Japanese or somebody else and they go elsewhere. So this is not a recipe for a good future for Canada or basically for anybody. So I wanna talk about some of that. So first of all, Robin, I'm looking at you. So Robin is the head of, of climate at the Insurance Bureau of Canada and the Insurance Bureau, as we all know, are the people with the money. 
Well, they have a lot of the money. And they have a lot of influence on finance in, in two big ways. Um, first of all, in who you insure and what you charge for insurance, which has an enormous influence on what risks that takes in the financial market um, and historically has been a really big supporter of fossil fuels. Um, and also the insurance companies invest a gigantic pool of money. Um, and again, moving those investments away from fossil fuels and into a clean economy would, would have a big impact. So Robin, I'm putting you on the spot, jet lag or no jet lag, and tell us, tell us about Canada's insurance industry. I mean, you folks know climate is happening. Your property and casualty people are paying heavily for it. What are you doing with that knowledge to move money into the green economy? Thanks, Diane, and thanks for having me. And um, uh, I do have access to caffeine, so I think I should be okay here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as you said, I, I, I'm the National Director of Climate Change for the Insurance Bureau of Canada, which is the um, National Industry Association for Home and Business and Auto Insurers. Often um, uh, in the industry, we would call those property and casualty insurers or PNC insurers. And my position exists, I think at least in part, because insurers, as you say, are impacted very, very directly by climate change. Um, like I'm 41. For, from the time I was born until I was 28, the average insurable payouts uh, in Canada for severe weather uh, disasters and events uh, averaged about $420 million annually. Uh, since I turned 28 until now, uh, the average has been over $2 billion. Um, and those are in real dollars. So the, the, the impact is very clear and it's very clear that uh, when you look at the various uh, sort of subsectors of the financial sector, uh, the insurance industry uh, has the greatest exposure to climate change. Um, and, and I think the industry has long advocated for better climate policy, um, both in terms of emissions reduction and uh, stronger adaptation policy. But I would say, I think it's fair to say that has only really started fully um, beginning to articulate its own role and how it can pull forward and smooth out the transition to a net zero economy probably since 2015. I mean, a, a lot of people in the sector would point to a speech that Mark Carney gave at Lloyd's of London uh, uh, in 2015, which was actually quite controversial at the time. He was talking about how, um, you know, we can only burn maybe a fifth of the uh, known oil and coal and fossil fuel reserves uh, and the rest of it would be stranded assets. And, and that was very controversial. And, and, you know, analysts said he was stepping outside of his file. Um, now that's just become the orthodox view, both among central bankers and, and you know, certainly in the, uh, in the financial sector. Um, so I think our role is to help our uh, members along their journey to net zero. Like th those of our members who uh, are making the shifts that you're talking about um, and, and uh, reallocating capital in ways that help pull forward the transition tend to be the ones who have developed uh, net zero plans uh, and, and not just high level net zero plans, but relatively granular net zero plans. Um, and they tend to be the members who are larger and have more resources and certainly have more resources devoted to this. So, you know, as an industry association, if we can create that space for our members to come together and allow those who are maybe a little further along their journey um, to help provide um, resources and info and guidance for those who are, are still getting there, um, that that's a big role for us. Um, so our, our board recently has decided to create something we're calling the Sustainable Finance Working Group, where we're bringing uh, key members together to discuss these issues and drive toward um, national industry positions on issues like um, uh, net zero and uh, uh, TCFD aligned uh, climate risk disclosure and, and various other uh, sustainable finance issues. So we've, we've seen a lot of uh, progress, but, um, you know, like, like many industries, uh, uh, I suspect the, the feeling is, uh, we could have started earlier. We could be further along. Um, but we're, we're going to sprint as fast as we can now. All right. Well, you could certainly have started earlier and been further along for absolutely sure. Certainly the insurance company was conspicuous when I was uh, commissioner in not speaking up on climate and not moving money, but I, I hope that's starting to change. Um, Talking about moving money, I want to go next to Tom. So Tom, there you are. You're in the business of getting money into breakthrough green tech companies. How hard is it to get the money to them? And 
is it making a difference? Uh, well, I, I would have a different answer for you if you'd asked the same question maybe two, two and a half years ago. Um, so for perspective, Arcturn, as you say, invests in technology companies. We're a classic venture fund, uh, all clean tech all the time. Uh, and so we invest in companies that are sort of early revenue moving into scale. Um, we've deployed about, uh, we have about 300 million under management. We have about 25 companies in that portfolio, energy storage, next generation solar, next generation biofuels, energy efficiency, that kind of thing. Um, and if you'd asked me two, two and a half years ago, uh, you know, when we raised our second fund, um, our second fund is composed of, of big institutions. So we do have um, some very large strategic players in the fund who are interested is two and a half years ago, three years ago, and in getting into clean tech and figuring out how to play. So it's Suncor, Equinor. We have a, a big pension fund out of Norway called Nisno. We have two pension funds from Canada, a Big Five Bank, and so on. But when we did that, we raised that fund. Well, I would say I could count on one hand the number of clean tech venture funds that existed in North America that were focused on what's now called climate tech. Uh, there are now probably 150 of those funds. Um, the world has changed fundamentally in the last two two and a half years um it's 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 late as any climate nerd knows but it, it's it's about time so i sort of say the cavalry's here and when i say the cavalry's here what i mean is that there are enormous funds tpg rise brookfield uh you know even larry fink is talking about a goldman's on the scene goldman sachs there's enormous amounts of capital poised to come into the sector traditional hedge, hedge funds that never and maybe don't even today, as people give a hoot about climate, um, are playing now. Tiger, Co2, these are very big funds, moving a lot of, a lot of capital. Um, so I said the Calvary's coming. It's great to see lots of capital flowing. But, and, and I think what's most interesting is to note, when I say non-climate nerds, you know, there are those of us who've been investing in this space because we are literally you know, physically sick about the risk we're facing. And that's kind of a driving force, right? We're trying to find ways to make money in that technology space, but we're really driven with a mission. And now we have all kinds of people coming in. And, and when you have people placing bets on a, low, on a transition to a low carbon economy who aren't traditional climate hawks, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. People now see the transition to a low carbon economy as inevitable. Uh, it is inevitable now. Uh, whether it's happening fast enough to mitigate climate risk is another question, right? The pace of change is very different. I can make a lot of money as a clean tech investor and we still don't solve the climate problem. Um, but it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that when these very large players from the financial sector begin to place these very big bets, they're jostling for a position to get a horse in, in the race on, on, on route to the low carbon economy, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I don't think it's a bubble. I mean, there's little mini bubbles. I can ret you know, return to that theme in a moment, but I don't think it's a bubble because there's enormous amounts of, of interest in the financial sector, but at the same time, from the corporate sector, there is a real need for solutions on, on the emissions file. I mean, it used to be five years ago, if you gave uh, somebody uh, a piece of technology that competed with the incumbent, so a low carbon solution versus a high carbon solution, high carbon solution is the incumbent, the new technology had to be you know, half the cost, twice as fast, et cetera. You had to really kick it out of the park because you were bringing risk to the table. You're changing the way people did their business. And now it's not the case. All, all, all else being equal, the corporate community will, will take on board these kind of low carbon solutions if the economics are at least at par. And that's a very changed demand cycle. So I don't think it's a bubble, um, but I do think there's a, a, a bit of a mismatch as these uh, money pours into the sector. There's a mismatch. Many people still have old ideas of energy systems, right? Hub and smoke, uh, massive agri, you know, massive central systems that distribute energy far. And because of that, they're, they're, they're placing, I think, inordinate amounts of money on, on, on bets that look like what they do today, but a low carbon version. So I'm thinking blue hydrogen, next generation nuclear. I mean, I think these are, these are, are, are not entirely rational ways of viewing the world. What I think is more interesting are, are the players who are moving money, who understand the world may not look like it does today as it moves into a low carbon state. Like, so highly distributed, solid state energy systems underwritten by technology. And it doesn't look like the old stuff. It looks like the new stuff. And, and that's kind of part of what I think is imply are two different competing visions of what the world will look like in 20 years. Um, I've got my bets, it's on the distributed side, um, but there are incumbents who are, are writing checks predicated on the notion the world's gonna look a lot like it does today. Um, and I think that's interesting because clean tech, uh, you know, I don't know that it's a sector, right? Just like the internet's not a sector anymore. It underpins the modern economy. Clean tech is highly horizontal, right? Every industry, whether you're forestry, you make movies, you make cars, you're a utility, you run buildings, everybody who produces or uses energy, which is everybody, engages with clean tech 
for new ways of producing and using that energy. So it's highly distributed across the economy, just, lo- just the way the internet is today. And that's what mean- that means it's disaggregated. So it doesn't look like energy systems used to, where you could write a $5 billion check, build a giant facility, problem solved. These are many, many, many smaller checks, five to $10 million energy retrofits and blah, blah, blah. So it's difficult for the financial sector to see how they play a, a more traditional role. Big systems, big checks. Uh, it may not look like that. So that's kind of a mismatch. And the last thing I'd note is, is there's a mismatch between technology and infrastructure. So one of the biggest, most interesting places for Canada to think about playing from a policy perspective is to enable technology that scales up to the infrastructure scale, because some of it does, is to figure out ways to get it scaled up in the first plant or two. After that, the private sector will, will take it over. But that first plant or two is very hard to build. The, the, the feds tried to solve this problem with some money with EDC. It didn't quite do it. BDC is at the table. But I still think there's a pretty big gap in that project finance piece where you're deploying capital that's bigger than a venture check, but smaller than a, than a, than a dam. And that's where I think there's lots of interesting places for Canada to play. So, so Tom, what I'm hearing is there's, there's people placing big bets, although a lot of them are still in the wrong things. But isn't it still the majority of the money going into fossil fuels? Oh, there's no question. Fossil fuel companies still spend uh, the vast majority of their free cash, if they're not spending it on dividends or share buybacks, and exploring for more, more oil and gas. And that, that's completely irrational. But that's the way the financial market still rewards those players. Their stock price is predicated on their known and provable reserves. So they have to keep replacing it every year, running like the Red Queen to stay in the same place. So yeah, there's still lots of of, of irrationality and and boatloads of money going into fossil fuels, make no mistake. But the point is, over the last two years, I have never seen the amount of capital coming into the sector that I see in the last couple of years. It's gone from millions to many hundreds of billions, and people are trying to figure out where to put it. Well, um, Alex has an idea. (laughs) So uh, Alex is here because he's got an idea where some of those hundreds of billions could go to make an enormous difference. Alex, why don't you tell us about it? Sure. Well, I'm the executive director of Our Energy Guelph. So we partner with the city of Guelph to make our community net zero carbon by 2050. And um, one of the uh, the focus points for us is on buildings. Uh, So just to give you a bit of a picture of of the, the story there, uh, 44% of emissions uh, Canada-wide fall within municipal scope, so they happen within municipal boundaries. And of that 44%, more than half uh, is coming from buildings. Um, that includes residential buildings, industrial, commercial, institutional buildings, and so forth. And a lot of those emissions, um, in the case of buildings, come from the way we generate heat. So it comes from space heating, typically in, in Guelph anyway, natural gas furnaces and natural gas, uh, uh, domestic hot water heating as well as the second one. And then the third is, is industrial process heat. Um, so that's really where a lot of the big problem is, a lot of wh- where the emissions are coming from. So uh, there are options for, for solving this problem. Uh, I think that one of the big barriers is people knowing that they're, that they're part of the problem and, and therefore making that shift to becoming part of the solution. But another, another challenge is, is just um, uh, understanding the nature of the problem. And so, uh, for example, uh, typic- take a, a typical household. What you're going to do there is, is you're going to uh, effectively want to put a sweater on the house. You want to insulate better, attic wall and basement insulation, uh, triple glazed windows, better weather stripping to eliminate drafts, that kind of thing. Um, so that's really about using less energy and, and getting rid of the leaks. Um, so the typical Canadian household leaks energy like a sieve. So the second part of the story is using energy more intelligently. And an example of that would be shifting away from burning natural gas, where the, the, the efficiency is measure, measured as a percentage, uh, where you get like a really good natural gas furnace is in the 90s of, of percentages. And shift away from that to heat pumps. Heat pumps have what's called a co- coefficient of performance, um, which means that they're in multiples of hundreds of, of, of uh, efficiencies. So if you put, say, um, th- 100 units of energy into a heat pump, you get 300 units of, of energy out, or really you get 300 units of energy moved, which is really the trick. So for the typical household, it's going to be about um, uh, using less through efficiency. It's about using it intelligently and also about making more of your own, and that's putting solar on your roof or putting a battery in your basement to, uh, to shift between um, expensive and dirty daytime electricity and, and, and cheaper uh, and cleaner nighttime electricity. So that's really the challenge for a typical household is, is how to, to use less, use it wisely and make more of your own. 
Um, and putting in solar panels on your roof or putting a battery in your basement, insulating better, those all cost a lot of money. There's a lot of upfront cost to that. And that is the single biggest barrier to, uh, to people moving ahead with these projects. So probably finance is one, awareness is the other, and maybe a third is simplicity, because it's really complicated to go through these, these, uh, these exercises. So um, a solution to this is to provide financing. And a very successful financing approach that's been uh, deployed to great effect in the United States is called PACE, or Property Assessed Clean Energy. And the way that works is instead of taking out a loan from the bank and having that in your name as, a, as, as the homeowner, you take out financing through the municipality and it gets attached to the property instead of you as the property owner, which means it doesn't affect your credit rating. And it also means that probably your own personal finances aren't part of the story because these projects really pay for themselves and the savings they produce. So the, um, uh, really the benefit from a homeowner perspective is I don't have to worry about my, my own personal credit rating being affected or my borrowing limit being affected. I don't have to worry about um, uh, a lot of the complexity that goes with a project like this. Uh, I can get help maybe from a local entity like our Energy Guelph to make it happen. And, um, uh, and then I can pay it off for over, over a much longer period of time than probably a bank is likely to, to be willing to accept. Uh, so if you look at the success in the United States, they've moved $9.3 billion uh, since this uh, program started in Berkeley, California in the mid-2000s. Uh, Sorry, $9.4 billion? US? US dollars, yes. That's a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> so that's a lot of money. Now, um, you have to look at that against the, the backdrop of what the size of the challenge is in Canada. If you take Guelph story and assume that it scales up by population, we're probably looking to invest probably between 500 and 600 billion dollars to solve the climate change problem on the, uh, um, the residential side of things or on the building side of things. So that's, that's a lot of money. Um, but uh, it's, it's my belief that, um, well, things are already moving. Like there are already programs in Canada. There's, there's one right here in Toronto, the Home Energy Loan Program. Little program. Little program, uh, but it's, it's, it's growing. And then there's one in, in Halifax called the Halifax Solar City Program, which on a per capita basis has been, been more successful. Um, but they're now sprouting up like mushrooms, uh, uh, partly thanks to help from the federal government via the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and some financing through a program they, hold, they have called uh, Community Efficiency Financing. So the federal government provides, provides money to FCM, FCM then on lends that money to communities who then run programs to deliver PACE financing to, uh, to homeowners. But Alex, isn't the problem, I mean, the federal government has provided money to the Green Municipal Fund, but it's what, a couple hundred million dollars for the whole country. And as you just said, we need hundreds of billions. So don't, we're not going to get this problem solved with the federal government handing out little bits of money through FCM. Absolutely. Don't we need some of those hundreds of billions that Tom was talking about? That's, that's, that's exactly right. That's a very good point. And well, how is, how is that money going to get into doing a lot of retrofits of individual homes? I mean, isn't that the point? As Tom said, they want to write $5 billion checks. They don't want to write checks for $44,000 for windows in a house. So, so how do we bridge that? Well, first of all, you have to get lots of communities getting started with programs like these. And so FCM is helping to make that happen. These programs start from zero and then they have to ramp up from there. So over time, you're going to get programs like in Toronto, they'll eventually reach the stage where they're going to be looking for capital on a scale where a pension fund is gonna be interested, where they're gonna be interested in writing a check of 50 million to 100 million dollars. But there's still a long way away from that. So one of the critical pieces that is missing is some kind of aggregator to sit in the middle to, um, and, and really FCM has, has served this role to some extent, but to bring in that private capital that's in those big 50 to $100 million chunks and then on lend it to those communities as they ramp their programs up and start reaching that sort of scale. We know that in Guelph, eventually we need to reach a, a scale of, of $100 million per year to be able to hit our target of becoming a net zero community by, by 2050. So Guelph is not a huge city. It's about 130, 140,000 people. So it's average size as Canada goes. Um, so a lot of communities, there, there are 444 municipalities in Ontario and more than 2,000 coast to coast. Every single one of them is going to have to develop a program like this and they're going to need capital. And having an intermediary that's there able to bring in that capital from the private sector to then on lend it to those communities is going to be critical. So Robin, I'm going to take this back to you. So you're hearing the kind of program that Alex is talking about and they need the kinds of the size of checks that your members can write 
why aren't we seeing any significant movement of capital from the insurance industry? They know this. They've been talking about it for years, but they're not moving the money at scale. What's it going to take? So I, I think I'm maybe a little more optimistic than you. I actually think um, the level of reallocation of capital we've seen in the insurance sector in the last seven years is is extraordinary, and it and it's also extraordinary in other uh, areas of the financial sector. Um, you know, as, as I said, it 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 needs to get better. My the whole existence of my job is premised on the idea that we can do better and more and faster. <laughs> but um, the you know, while I can't speak to sort of specific small scale investments um, at a high level, as the insurance industry is more and more moving toward net zero, um, we are we are seeing some fairly large shifts, right? Like we we know that um, uh, in in say the last twenty four months, uh, the the net zero owners alliance, uh, the UN convened group that uh, uh, convenes uh, pensions and and um, uh, the investment arms of insurance companies. Uh, they've put together quite a large group with with you know billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of capital. Uh, and this and this group is now uh, requiring its members to have science based interim long term uh, goals to reach net zero in their investment portfolios no later than 2050 uh, with interim goals along the way. And, and these aren't just sort of empty pledges, like you're seeing them roll out as um, uh, sort of granular uh, net zero plans in many of the members who have uh, joined on. And then, as you mentioned off the top, obviously, when it comes to the insurance sector, and uh, their role in pulling forward the, the uh, transition to a net zero economy, there's sort of two sides to it. There's also the underwriting side. And we know that um, tomorrow in Glasgow will be the announcement of the Net Zero Insurance Alliance, which is um, essentially is the sort of sister organization that's focused on underwriting. And, you know, as as more and more insurers have um, developed net zero plans and are beginning to implement them, we're seeing um, some changes that are, are very loud and splashy. Uh, you know, some insurers are divesting uh, from areas like coal, I know 23 major insurers um, have have either ended or limited insurance for the coal industry in the last uh, 12 months. Um, over the past 12 months, uh, nine major insurers have ended or limited um, insurance for the oil sands industry. Um, but then there are also all the, the changes that we don't see in the press because there are many more uh, insurers who are um, starting to engage in, in engagement with these companies and um, encouraging them to uh, move themselves toward a net zero business model uh, or risk or risk losing their capital. So I, I, I am a bit more uh, optimistic about both where we're at and um, where we're going. And I think it's these, these sort of high level agreements um, can be very helpful uh, in terms of uh, having that sort of social pressure and business pressure on um, the broader financial sector to, to keep moving in the direction that we need them um, to go. But, you know, in the end, I think it's just that the numbers uh, more and more just make so much sense. Like the, you know, in, in the kinds of investments that Tom were talking about uh, have, have been, you know, very, very profitable for those who were in those sectors and and obviously um the fossil fuel sector has some um uh, needs to make some shifts some sort of fundamental shifts in its business model uh in order to be able to keep up so so yeah i think it's it's going to be a mix of just you know the numbers make sense and then um the industry has a clear direction robin you mentioned the net zero alliance and um thank you principal um what percentage of Canadian insurers are in the Net Zero Alliance? How many of them are actually doing this, setting these targets? So we have, try to think of our members who are in it. Um, Aviva, Munich Re, Swiss Re, SCORE, Zurich. I'm probably missing at least one. Of course, the, the thing about the insurance uh, sector that you have to keep in mind is um, uh, there are a lot of 
insurers and reinsurers who have large operations in Canada where headquarters might be in the UK or in Europe, but obviously they would have a Canadian headquarters and, and a large Canadian presence, so they would be members of ours. And those tend to be the members who are involved in those uh, sort of large scale initiatives. Um, and then I know that some other insurers who are uh, domestically based have also uh, moved toward developing net zero plans um, and tech comes to mind. Um, and and it, there will only be more and more as we go. And that's, that's part of my uh, role that I discussed earlier, which is just sort of creating the space for um, those who are a little bit ahead, perhaps because uh, some mix of you know, if you're a company whose headquarters is in uh, a country where your uh, regulatory development on on sustainable finance is ahead, um, if you're you know in a political context where um, the the importance of sustainable finance was uh, perhaps more central a little bit earlier, and uh, if you know if you're in a country that doesn't have a large fossil fuel sector, obviously you know there there are reasons why. Uh, some would be ahead of others. Um, so yeah, so we're just trying to create that space to ensure that, you know, although no industry moves in lockstep on any issue, um, that that really sort of pulling forward uh, that movement. Right. Tom, how, wait for Tom, there we are. Um, I'm interested in how Canada compares to the rest of the world. So we, we have a big landmass, not very many people. We have a long tradition of having innovators that get bought out and go somewhere else. I mean, how is sustainable finance in Canada compared to the rest of the world? Are we losing our best and brightest ideas? I saw Ecobee got bought by somebody in the US uh, yesterday. Are we going to be able to have a strong green sector here or are we just generating ideas that someone else is going to buy and take away? Uh, well, that's always been a problem in, in, in Canada, frankly, just because the Americans just south uh, operate at a scale that that's much larger than than what than we do. Um, that said, uh, you know, there there are uh, and that's partly a matter of scale and the appetite of the, of the financial community on an M&A transaction to acquire companies. Part of that is in the entrepreneurial mindset of of, of the founders and the board. I mean, we, we recently had a company got a very large buyout offer down in California. It's an American company. And it seemed to me that it would be something that one, one would take. It was a very large number. And it was immediately turned down uh, because their ambition is to build something global and big and massive. And so there is a, there is a cultural a gap in terms of, of, the, of the aspirations of entrepreneurs here. And, but that's closing, right? I mean, we have Shopify. Uh, we have, you know, HydroStore very well, Diane. Uh, that's going to be a very, very large company. Uh, and it will stay headquartered in Canada because we have a board and a set of investors that could support it. So the question is not so much getting getting bought up, but but is the capital available for for companies to continue to expand operations and and, and companies that that are Canadian operate globally, right? So there is this notion uh, that you're a Canadian company, but you're you know you're, you think you're selling into Canada. It's not the case, right? And any company we invest in that's Canadian is selling into global markets, and the challenge is to find the follow-on capital. Uh, to keep those companies here. So folks like John Ruflo has a new fund called Maverick, which is, which writes very large checks, private equity sized checks, which allows companies to sort of have the capital to match the ambitions of being a global, a global company. So I think the culture is there and we have a history of this, um, but that culture is changing and, and there are emerging uh, financial actors to kind of help the companies stay here and, and grow. That said, you're right, Dan, it, historically, that's what we do. It still happens. Um, it will probably still continue to happen. Uh, but you just want to you want to lessen it. I mean, that's why Mars exists, right? I, I back in the day, I was a clean tech founder there to found the clean tech project. That's why Mars was there. I mean, the the, the patriarch and founder of of Mars, uh, Dr. John Evans, saw that we produced intellectual property in this com in this country uh, at the same rate and same quality as anybody around the world on a per capita basis: Israel, Boston, San Francisco. But the amount of capital and jobs that we generate from that intellectual property is uh, about a 10th of our American cousins. And Mars, you know, is a big mandate, try to solve that problem. Well, how do you solve that problem? You solve it through capital, through culture, through connection, through through whatever. It's not an easy thing to do, but but I think it is beginning to change for sure. You think we're more than 10% now? I would guess we're more than 10%. I, I don't know, I don't know. I haven't seen it measured in a while, um, but you know, we, like, for example, my, my anecdotally, I mean, I the companies that we've invested in uh, are staying in Canada. Uh, they're not taking buyout offers any any time in that early phase, and there is capital to support them. 
Now they have to have operations globally, right? I mean, you're a Canadian company, but you're not selling in Canada. You're selling all over the globe. Um, and I think that kind of mindset in clean tech, you know, Canada, what Canada got right, frankly, in the last 15 years is a lot of it has to do with SDTC, Sustainable Development Technology Canada. We have a, an amazing farm team in Canada where there are reasonably good opportunities that have been scaled and funded, but it's a farm team, you know, it's not the big leagues yet. And so the challenge is to find capital and build executive teams and equip them with the capital they need to go after global markets and do it and do it very quickly. And other countries are, we're kind of polite, right? Other countries are much more aggressive about how they do this. The Americans, when they decide to get into something, the US Department of Energy shoves low cost capital down the throats of these companies and they become, that's where Tesla came from. That's where Solar City came from. That's where some of the biggest solar and wind developers around the world came from, all through big loan programs out of the Department of Energy back in Obama's day. And now Biden's back. So you bet that, that that's gonna kick up again. And we've had the relative advantage in Canada of, of having a recalcitrant uh, a climate denier south of the border. And you know we got European investors in our fund partly because they wanted a seat in North America, but they did not want to be based in the United States during that time. Now that advantage is gone. We need to be less polite, more aggressive. We have to go after clean tech the way we go after hockey, right? We're tough on the ice. We're not tough on, on, on the field when it comes to clean tech. South Korea has a very cohesive strategy as to how to export their solutions around the world. You know, and we all, you know, we, for example, Canada plays nice. Well, we're not supposed to tie foreign aid to Canadian technologies. Well, guess what everybody else does, right? Germany will provide engineering services for free on an energy project in Africa. And guess what they do? They spec in German equipment. Like it's not, you know, it's not a, it's not a secret. So there, I think there are ways that we can be more aggressive about how we go after these global markets and support that farm team uh, into becoming uh, big global players. I think we can be more aggressive there. Right. So let me take you back to, to Robin. Are you seeing the support from the Canadian insurance industry? No, actually I'm asking Tom, are you seeing Robin's folks, um, do they, are they insuring these companies? Are they lending to these companies? Is the insurance companies, are the insurance companies stepping up that you can see in your world? No, no that's not really their role though, um, to be fair. So when you're building your third plant and your fourth plant, that's when we get traditional financing that would come from the insurance sector. The insurance sector typically doesn't really understand the technology risk associated with, with large projects when they haven't been done a bunch of times before. And asking them to come to us is probably a bit much. What is happening though, is there are insurance products like new energy risk and so on. EDC is playing a bit of an insurance game in, in providing kind of a, a financial coverage on, on some of the risk associated with these new technologies. That was a policy that came out of the feds. They put $450 million into EDC to accelerate. So you, by EDC, you mean the Export Development Corporation. Export Development Canada, yeah, to, to help them provide capital to first of a kind large capex clean tech uh, facilities it you know it's going not as well as the policy would have hoped it would go and part of that part of that is because we're again edc says we're not allowed to provide a subsidy it's against the the, the, the gentleman's club rules of all the export import banks around the world um so they sort of they, they don't provide the kind of financing that would move the market because they say their hands are tied. Well, the question is, well, why did you get the money in the first place? And if you can't fulfill the policy and there's a, so that's where we have these sort of funny little mismatches in, in our policies um, that have great intentions coming from the ministers. But on the ground, they tend not to get uh, uh, they, they don't move as fast or aggressively as, as probably they should. Right. Although they still got a lot of money invested into the oil sands last year. But, all right. Leaving that aside. So uh, I should say, does anybody want to ask, uh, anyone in the audience here or online want to ask us any questions? Uh, let's start with the folks that are here in person. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, I had a question about uh, PACE and... Thank you. Um, I had a question about PACE and um, Guelph's plans for clean energy. And I was just wondering, um, I think it's a, a great plan, um, but I was also wondering whether you looked at other ways to deliver clean electricity to homes. Um, for example, I know the geothermal energy, uh, geothermal industry is very eager to, you know, um, provide their services because they say that it's cost effective now uh, where it wasn't in the past. And so there are other approaches maybe for even large, you know, plant or community uh, types of uh, distribution of energy rather than changing each house and then just delivering electricity. I'm just wondering whether all of those different options were considered for Guelph. 
Okay, thank you. Excuse me, I'm just gonna ask everybody to keep your mask on except, except when you're talking, please. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Alex. Well, I think there, there are two different geothermal stories. One is geothermal as a power generation uh, tool, and the other is as, as, a, um, as a way of supplying heating and cooling for a building. And those are two very different stories. I, I think that um, I'm seeing a lot of good signs about uh, this kind of swords into plowshares phenomenon that's happening in the fossil fuel sector, where businesses that used to do drilling for oil and gas are now getting into the geothermal business. And uh, there, there are made in Canada technologies that are making waves around the world there, like the Everloop is an example of that, um, where they've, they've taken a traditional kind of closed loop geothermal um, approach, and uh, they've been able to remove some of the, the parasitic loads, as they call them, that, that uh, uh, detract from the efficiency and therefore make it less cost effective. So they've been able to crack some of those problems. So I see good things happening in that, in that front. Um, Guelph has a challenge on the other side of things for, for geothermal as a heating and cooling source in that we are a, a groundwater dependent community for our potable water supply. And um, uh, it's, it's absolutely true that, that uh, geo exchange systems can be implemented uh, in a way that is, um, it is entirely safe using state of the art best practices. But I think the city has taken a conservative approach to start uh, and they've made a, a guideline which uh, makes it very difficult to pursue any geothermal um, on a, a uh, individual building or, or a subdivision level in our community. Um, next door in Kitchener-Waterloo, they've, they've uh, opened it up and there's a, a fantastic success story um, of a, uh, th the name of the building is escaping me right now, but uh, it's, a, uh, it's um, in the, uh, the, the Rim Park area and uh, they, use, they use geothermal there with a, a deep well uh, loop and um, uh, interestingly, when last I visited that building, they weren't using it uh, because they also had uh, solar collectors, uh, solar thermal collectors in, in the, the walls of the building, and it was the coldest day of the year, and those were supplying more than enough heat for the building's needs. Oh, so, I've been in that building. It was great. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Evolve One, that's the name yes. of it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so there are exciting stories like that around, uh, and I think that, um, but th the bottom line still remains, um, if... If your buildings are leaking energy like a sieve, then then close up the leaks first, and then then uh, I mean, make sure that you're doing that as part of the package of of the solution that you're providing. For the past ten years, for the past ten years, I've been uh, involved with uh, what you call a for-profit cooperative. And uh, we are considering, of course, the community financing as a, a, a potential tool or one of the uh, elements of uh, funding that could be considered in, in the case of the clean technologies and climate change at large. And uh, throughout these years, we have been involved with solar PV, uh, heat pump, and we are now moving into deep energy retrofit and so on. All of that based on the interest of the local community to put money into a co-op to solve their local problem or to be involved with the local, uh, I would say, development. And you can go as far as being district heating with that concept or you know, local energy uh, uh, generation and distribution, now that we can do a little bit of net metering and so forth. And my question is, how will you consider such type of uh, community financing via, I will say, uh, co-op, uh, for-profit co-op or not for-profit co-op, as a, as a viable tool to deploy and tackle climate change, I would say, at the grassroots level um, throughout Canada? Well, that's an excellent question. And in fact, uh, Guelph is a, is a pioneer in the cooperative movement. Uh, the the uh, um, Ontario Association of Cooperatives is based in Guelph. And um, we've all, we're also something of a pioneer on uh, the front of, of using community capital for, uh, for environmental and social projects. So we have the Guelph Renewable Energy Co-op for example, as, as a, uh, a, um, it's a, a vehicle where members of the community can invest in bonds that are, were then used for putting solar on rooftops. Um, th that kind of stalled after the, uh, the Green Energy Act came to an end. Uh, but then there are other examples. Um, there's a local uh, social enterprise accelerator uh, and collision space called 10C. Um, they did a community bond issue to, uh, to uh, finance the, their expansion into a larger building that was also uh, very um, uh, replete with um, with energy efficient and, and uh, 
climate friendly and environmentally friendly technologies like rainwater harvesting, for example. So there, there are some really good examples of that in Guelph. I think that uh, as far as mobilizing community capital to solve the climate problem, um, when we talk about pension funds, when we talk about insurance companies, it's actually, that's exactly what you're doing. Uh, you're taking the premiums that, that, uh, insure, that, um, uh, that policyholders have paid, you're taking the, uh, the contributions that, that pensioners, uh, their, that pension fund holders have made, and you're circling that back into the local community. And I think that there's tremendous opportunity for that. And there's also tremendous opportunity for the direct route within the community uh, to, to do something like was done with, with the Wealth Renewable Energy Co-op or the 10 C community bond issue, where we offer bonds to the public and we say, your money is gonna go into a pool of money that will be allocated towards helping homeowners to insulate better and put solar on the roof and, and, uh, and so forth. So I think that there's a, a huge uh, opportunity there. Um, I don't know if this is really still an issue, but I know that in Ontario, there, there was a, a big challenge with the Green Energy Act around uh, a sense of community involvement and community ownership. And because that was absent, I think it gave a lot of uh, space for entities like Wind Concerns Ontario to appear to challenge that and to, to express uh, um, opposition to those kinds of projects. I think that um, that was very different from the way things went in Germany, where there was a strong community uh, ownership component and where uh, somehow that rendered people immune to wind turbine syndrome, the fact that they own part of the wind turbine that was on the, on the hillside. Uh, and that's, uh, there's some very interesting studies, uh, one out of Australia that show that, that relationship where essentially, I think that it's a story of when people own part of the product uh, or part of the initiative that you're, you're constructing, um, that provides a certain amount of social license and insulates you against some of that, that opposition that would otherwise appear. And so one of the things that you and I talked about earlier this year and that maybe Massey could think about is why don't we have the university pension plans and even the university endowments investing in exactly this kind of retrofit program that benefits the immediate community? I mean, why don't students and faculty and staff at Massey have access to a fund that Massey owns. Why isn't that being invested in this kind of thing? Yes, there's an administrative challenge. It's easier to write a $5 billion check. I don't know the size of the Massey endowment, but it's right, easier to write big checks than to do small things, but there is the capacity here, and surely there's enough smart people in Massey between the junior fellows, the senior fellows, the faculty, and the staff to come up with a way to be recirculating that money locally. And we also know it creates an awful lot of jobs. Oh, yeah. So you get all these brilliant young people being trained here. Are there going to be enough jobs for those folks building a green economy here? So Corporate Knights did their big study last year to show you can get hundreds of thousands of jobs created in Ontario through a retrofit program like this. So you guys pester your university, pester your college and, uh, and ask these questions. Yes. Okay. All right. Next, please. Oh, I have two questions. One is for Alex. Um, I know that you used to work in the municipality and working in those decision-making roles and then coming out as an entrepreneur to, to deliver the, build and deliver those programs. Um, when we're talking about municipality-backed funding and then putting that into context that Canada is about $60 billion behind in infrastructure renewal, where do municipalities actually get the funding to fund those projects, first of all? And then how do they fund projects when we're talking about retrofit programs where some of the paybacks are in the range of eight to 10 years when everyone's looking for a four-year payback? And then the second question is to, to Tom is um, in the kind of a- well, Wait a second, let Alex answer this question. <laughs> all right, Alex, go ahead. Well, the short answer is, um, for, for larger communities, they, they have taken money out of, out of municipal reserves to make it happen. And that's what Toronto did. And I, I, my understanding is that that's what uh, Halifax did. Um, a city like Guelph doesn't really have the wherewithal to do that kind of thing. And that's why an entity like the Federation of Canadian Municipalities plays such a pivotal role. Uh, so I think that the, the story is the municipal municipality as capital provider is probably sorry, you should probably explain the green municipal fund oh yeah sorry i should i should explain that so uh the the federation of canadian municipalities as the name suggests is is a an organization of of most of the 2000 municipalities coast to coast and part of it is is um uh sharing uh, experiences through uh groups like the um uh um 
the uh, there's there's a, a climate change uh, professionals network that they that they run there uh, called the Partners for, for Partners for Climate Protection and communities can uh, can sign on to pledges to to uh, reduce emissions and so forth. Uh, but another big chunk of it is providing an avenue for funding to be allocated to local communities through something called the Green Municipal Fund, which came from the federal government, which came from a billion the billion and so, a half dollars. That's right. So, so this, this endowment comes from the federal government, and then that's broken up into various different programs, one of which is the Community Efficiency Financing Program. So what, the way I expect that things are going to unfold is the dozen or so communities that have gotten funding from the CEF program in this first round will build their programs and start getting some momentum, and I think start building confidence among municipal decision makers and bureaucrats that this is doable, um, and also uh, that it's that it's low risk. I mean, the, the fact is that the municipal property tax default rate is already very, very low, which is part of the reason why municipal debt is so cheap, because it's a very, very low risk kind of scenario. Um, and if you look at properties that have PACE loans on them, their default rate is actually lower than the average. So you're taking the cream right off the top of the churn there, uh, as far as uh, the, the very lowest risk um, properties go. And from an investor perspective, if you can aggregate that across multiple communities, wow, what a great news, good news story that is. And if you can then maybe combine that in with, um, uh, with adding like a green municipal bond story to that, um, that could, like, if, you're, if you're talking about where you can drive the ca cost of capital down to, like it's, 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 uh, the, the potential is very, very exciting for, for how low you can get that, that cost of capital to make it economical for, for homeowners to, to do this. And as you pointed out, eight to 10 year paybacks, it's, it's, it's tough to, to uh, then when you put an interest rate on top of that, it, it pushes the payback out a ways. Now, PACE has one mitigating feature, which is that you can just pass it on to the next homeowner, and by default, that's what happens. Um, uh, and in about 50% of cases on sale, it'll transfer to the new owner. And I think that, that as communities get used to this idea of the municipality playing a role in investing in the quality of the buildings in the community, and that PACE is the mechanism to do that, people will get more used to that idea and we'll probably see that 50% that uh, carryover figure rise. Um, and we also see a lot of things that are driving the cost down. Uh, again, um, so with Alex's help, I wrote an article in Corporate Nights about PACE financing, which you're welcome to check out. Corporate Nights also did a Build That Better program last year, which showed that the key to bringing the cost down is scaling up. Doing things bespoke per house is ridiculously expensive. Just, I've just done it. it. makes no sense. But if we do it in large scales, we get the people trained, we get the contractors trained, and the costs come down really fast so the payback periods will improve. So that, that would help a lot. Um, you had a second question uh, for, uh, are there any questions online, Matt? Oh, there's two questions. Okay. You know what? I'll try to get back to you if we can get time. Uh, what are the questions online? All right. Question. Ah from Ambassador McCarney. Uh, did anything from the G20 suggest we'll see government action versus just chatter, more studies, et cetera? Are you more optimistic about that the private sector investment fund decarbonizing will lead? All right, Robin, this is for you. You're at uh, COP26. You've got any grounds for optimism? I mean, I, I have grounds for optimism about COP26. I don't know that I can speak to um, anything that came out of the G20 that necessarily made me particularly optimistic. Um, I. Uh oh. <laughs> Peter, help. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to go on to the next question. We lost. I can actually, I can comment on that that question briefly, if you if you like, Diane. Um, not maybe around COP, but uh, around the private sector leading. Uh, the private sector is now leading, ironically. I mean, the public sector they're ratcheting up their targets. So they're talking a very good game about emissions reductions, 40% down from 1990 levels, net zero by 2050 and so on. I think what's becoming increasingly obvious uh, is the math is getting really, really difficult, right? That, that those pledges uh, are extremely difficult to meet. I, you know, I, you need five to see, any time in history we've seen a five or 6% reduction in emissions um, was when the Soviet Union collapsed. So I think people are beginning to understand how tough the math is. So those pledges are great, you know, guiding guideposts that begin to match the science, begin to, but they're very difficult. So they're ahead of the game on 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 nice numbers finally. Uh, but the corporate the side, the private side, is ahead of the Fed, the the, the, the public side, ironically now, on moving capital. 
Um, again, I can't overstate the amount of capital and the appetite there is. What I think we need from our political leaders is to focus where that capital goes through smart policy, right? Again, we come down to things like carbon pricing, we come down to things like using the WTO to level the playing field between countries so you can get more aggressive and not worry about looting, losing your, your industry to others who essentially are carbon cheats. So I think there is a very focused role now for the public sector. They don't need to write a lot of checks. What they do need to do is provide the aggregator function that people have been talking about a lot, like aggregation, a new institution like a green bank to aggregate the kind of assets that have been discussed at the community level. That's important. Uh, focusing uh, the private capital into sectors like through carbon pricing, through regulatory frameworks. That's more important than ever. The good news is the public sector doesn't, doesn't have to write checks and we're broke, COVID <laughs> broke the bank. Uh, the private sector is there with capital, but it needs to be guided through intelligent and aggressive national policies, which I, I hope we see post COVID. All right, and provincial policy. So as you know, Tom, I and provincial just, policies, of course, just issued a climate plan for the Green Party of Interior where we do all those things. Um, and if anybody's interested, you can find that at gpo.ca slash climate. Um, Alyssa, what else do we have online? Okay, regarding insurance for green technologies, what's the risk if predictions are wrong and there's cooling over the next day and kind of a sunspot activity? Well, um, Robin, do you want to try that one? Robin. Have we lost Robin? All right. Um, well, if Robin comes back, he can talk about insurance, but uh, certainly some of you know I've been working on climate. I'm back. Oh, there's Robin. You're back. <laughs> Sorry so, about Robin, that. <laughs> Robin, the, the question we just had is what if all the scientists are wrong and they had the world actually cooled because of sunspots? What does that mean for insurance? Do you want to try that one? For insurance? I mean, there's this great comic. I don't know if you've seen it where uh, someone someone lists all the benefits for taking climate action. It's, you know, yeah. we're going to have cleaner air and we're going to have right. better human health and we're going to have this, we're going to have that. And then someone stands up and yells out, but what if this is all a hoax? What if we build a better world for nothing? For nothing. So I, I use you know, that cartoon a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, comf I'm comfortable with that as a, as an outcome, as a sort of long tail risk on, uh, on that scenario. All right. Okay. That's fine. Um, I think we can get, one more. Uh, is your question really short? Okay, go ahead. Short. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, to, uh, question for Tom is, um, from my limited understanding of the financial world, it seems that venture capital is looking for really um, building companies up to go public and exiting um, and get their money back. So how does that align with investing in green technology and possibly even aligning with um, backing municipal kind of initiatives to um, help the community? So how does that align or is that not aligned in terms of a capitalist system of investing and in venture capitalism? Okay, real simple question, Tom. You got a quick answer? Yeah, well, in the first one, in terms of, of building technologies, uh, you know, we, we have a 10 year time horizon on our funds. So we're in the game for 10 years, which is, you know, a fairly long time for early stage investing. And there are other players in the ecosystem, private equity and so on, and public markets that continue to allow those companies to grow by providing different kinds of capital over long periods of time. So venture capital has a role. Uh, we will get companies to market, we'll scale them up, but it's not, we're, it's not our job to build them into $100 billion BMS. Uh, we don't have the capital for that. Uh, that's what the insurance has money for, uh, big banks and, and public markets. So we play a role and um, others pick the baton up from us uh, as, as we go around the track. In terms of community finance, yeah, we don't, we don't invest in that. We don't invest in projects. We invest in technologies that ultimately improve the economics of those projects over time. So we wouldn't invest in a, in a solar farm or a heat pump installation, but we would invest in a better, faster heat pump and uh, better, cheaper, more efficient solar materials. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to everybody who asked a, a question. Um, uh, Robin, thank you for staying up for us. That was really kind of you. Um, so that that's going to wrap us up today. Uh, please do check out the uh, climate page under our work on the Massey College website. There will be a tape of this up within a few days. Oh, it's available right now. Ah, it's available right now. So if anybody missed it, um, please uh, pass it on to them, encourage them to watch it. We'll have another event in just over two weeks, uh, three weeks, I guess, November 23rd. Um, we're going to be talking about the role of cities in climate action, and then we'll have a wrap up and reflection on COP um, on December the 
14th. Uh, so that'll tell us whether there was any grounds for optimism or not. Robin, I hope you're right and we get something useful out of this process. But um, we need to keep talking about climate. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. Everybody needs to be, keep talking about climate, keep asking questions. Uh, I'm really convinced if we get this wrong, nothing else is going to matter. So thanks for your time and attention. And um, let's hope that something good happens in Glasgow. Take care, everybody. <laughs>